Om Yo Brahmanan Vidadati Purvam Yo Vai Vedanscha Prahinohi Tasmai Tanhadeva Atma Bhudi Prakasha Mumukshurvai Sharnamaham Prapadje Om Shantihi 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 <coughs> that one indivisible and all-pervasive presence out of which sprang the divine trinity at the beginning of a cosmic cycle. And who is vouchsafed the Upanishads? to Lord Buddha, to Lord Brahma, who is an eternal bridge to immortality. Who is partless, formless, actionless, and divine. Who resembles fire that has consumed all its fuel. I go for refuge to that Supreme Brahman who turns the attention of mankind to the light of the Atman, the indivisible self within. Om peace, peace, peace. Peace be unto us, peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Datsat. With that chant and sloka from the Upanishads, we enter into the second class on the subject of the role of memory in spiritual life, and also as it pertains to reincarnation in this time, that is the cycle that I just mentioned, that the Supreme Lord saves us from when we concentrate fully upon our true nature, the Atman. That's the cycle called birth, life, death, and rebirth. It's a fourfold movement, sometimes taught as just birth, life, and death, but the rebirth is being concentrated on in this particular class in terms of focusing on Daiva Smriti, or the divine memory, because there's this problem in this day and age, particularly called Vishmriti. And I'll show you a chart on that at the end of the series, probably next week. But it's this forgetfulness of the divine being. And <clears throat> we know that remembrance of this divinity is at least, if not more than half the battle of spiritual practice. Because we remember to do our sadhana each day, we remember to meditate, we remember to keep studying the scriptures, and we remember our ishtam that, and the mantra that's been given to us that connects us to our ishtam. As my teacher Swami Sheshanandaji Maharaj, peace and bliss be upon him, often said, how did I remember Holy Mother when I came here to the West and left India behind for the last time, came to teach Vedanta to the Westerners? I remembered her and made contact with her through the mantra. So this divine remembrance is a very important thing. And I mentioned last week about Swami Sheshanandaji Maharaj remembering the entire Gita in both English and Sanskrit and being able to recite it to us even in his 90s. So this retentive memory is a, is a nice expression in English is something that needs to be worked on and in this day and age mostly uncovered. Uh, and it goes hand in hand with the teaching that all knowledge lies within in you. The father of yoga said that's one of the seven laws of yoga. Or I think it can even be put as an interpretation of how Christ said the kingdoms of heaven are within you. So in that way, uncovering the memory is just a matter of checking in with all that 
mother wisdom that exists inside the hearts and minds and all beings. We could sing it again like we did last week. Yadevi Sarva Bhuteshu, Smriti Rupena, that is, the very, she's a very form of memory existing in the hearts and minds of all beings. Namastasyai, 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 Namo Maha. We salute thee again and again. So this remembrance of spiritual axioms as far as the non-dual wisdom goes, Advaita, and remembrance of the teachings of the Dharma as far as qualified non-dualism, Shishtadvaita goes, and the remembrance of worship, uh, saying the mantra, offering flowers to the image on the shrine, in terms of Dvaita or dualism in India, the rich and, and, and f full dualism. All three of these levels of philosophical understanding are open and should be fostered in us. And the memory is going to play this huge role in that. For example, all the people who are forgetting to do those very things, and then they have no spiritual life, and quite often you see that they lose their peace of mind at the slightest drop of a hat, as the expression goes. So <clears throat> we, don't, we want to be more like Karmapa, putting on the black crown, the black hat ceremony that I attended several times in my life. It's, it's, a, it's a great it's a view and sight, and, and it brings to memory this inherent wisdom that's in our mind, uh, not just in our brain as some sort of nostalgia or some sort of relative knowledge that uh, if we, or, or some sort of minutia, a, a game that you play trying to make money remembering things that don't mean anything in life in the end. So this divine remembrance, Daiva Shmriti, is what we want to concentrate on. And uh, I've been approaching this series, and it only occurred to me almost before I started speaking last Sunday on this, that I could almost hear the questions coming in from certain people, people who are practicing Advaita and maybe uh, not understanding it yet, people who were pretending to understand Advaita, non-duality, and making a mess of it, philosophically speaking. People who were Buddhists uh, or followers of certain non-dual schools that are current in the day and time right now, which speak about not needing to take stock of practice, not needing to remember your karmas, your samskaras, uh, and all of this. So basically, bringing that and recalling that to memory is a part of the spiritual practice which purifies the mind. So we chanted last week that the Atman can't be made pure by anything, by bhakti or by jnanam, by bowing at the Guru's feet, by meditating your thoughts away. The Atman's always pure. So that's the part of this declaration that we agree with, with all the schools of Advaita, that that's the true part. But it does, we, we don't want to, and I never heard my teachers speak in this way at all, we don't want to forego keeping the mind pure, like Shankar said, wiping the mirror of the mind every day so that his vision of reality is, is always free of um, overlays, conditionings, um, the dust of relativity, the dust of the cosmos, not just the outer cosmos that is a bunch of stardust in the sky, but this dust of the mind, which is ignorance coming from the collective mind, from the ancestors. All of these things need to be, need to have a, a, a polishing uh, uh, every day in order to keep this vision of divinity fresh and and therefore, from life to life, as we're talking about now, rebirth, coming back with full recall of everything that we learned before. If this were the case, 
then it explains why some people don't go running back to school. They don't go looking for a job. They don't go trying to make money. They don't try, go trying to get popular or successful. Many of these people actually retire from life, become recluses or become sannyasins, uh, and uh, renounce the world, especially the outer world. So it's this inner world which I'm going to be talking about today because, as I said last week, it, it occurred to me that people were going to be questioning something I might say that said, well, uh, there's this transmigration process going on when you talk about birth, life, death, and rebirth. And then the first question that pops up in, in somebody who has some understanding of non-duality or has listened to some of these higher teachers, but what is it that's transmigrating, Babaji? And uh, who is it that's doing that? So I put that in the in, in the solution department last week when we looked at the five she's consciousness in its conglomerate phase that is when it's dumbed down when it's thinned down when it's burdened upon by conditionings by samskaras by karmas by lower thinking by habits uh, then it it uh, it teases to this body mind mechanism so we answered the question of what is it that's transmigrating last week. It's, it's the body-mind mechanism, if you want to put it very simply. Or we have another word for it, the danta, the psychophysical being. Now, those things are insentient, according to Samkhya, Vedanta, and so forth. They don't have any real existence of their own without consciousness associating with them. But the, the mind's consciousness can become so convoluted and so focused upon objects and about on about on energy and on thought none of which is brahman the upanishads say it's 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 not matter it's not energy and it's not thought but it's pure conscious awareness so that pure conscious awareness is is being um, limited there's uh, various conditionings put upon it and of course if you studied buddhism and other systems of of indian philosophy you'll know that these what these conditionings are such things as the six passions and we'll look at a few of them today because i'm going to take not only vedanta but i'm going to take zen buddhism too and show you how indian thought has reached all the way around the world now when it came to america with swami vivekananda in 1893 at the Parliament of Religions, and has, as it made its circular, its circuitous route around the world, reaching many, many countries, these truisms were dropped on various countries. And certain thinkers, some of them more open-minded, some of them more closed, some of them with more acumen, some with less, began to take these great declarations and express them in a way that their limited understanding could express it. But we want to make sure to keep these teachings pure, straight from the source of Mother India, like they would come from the rishis of the Upanishads, whom I just chanted before we started the class. I take refuge in that Brahman. I remember that Brahman, who is like a fire that's consumed all its fuel, and out of which came the cosmic trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and who vouchsafed the scriptures to Lord Brahma so that these could be passed to all the worlds. And then when they reached a world like this, Burloka, they could be passed around the world by this continuing work that, that uh, the great darshanas of India are trying to keep existent and alive, <clears throat> even in the Kali Yuga, such as today. So that's a kind of recap on what we looked at last week in terms of this chart that we looked at, which I made as a quick cover chart, the problems of Vishmriti and the solutions that we, that we wanted to look at. Because mind in these days are given to random thoughts, then it fails to learn to concentrate in the present life. That's scattered mind, dull mind, 
It fails to learn to concentrate. Uh, that's the sixth limb of yoga. It's a good penultimate goal. I will learn to concentrate on something, focus my mind completely. And then it begins to transmigrate. It becomes a complex. It forgets its lifetime uh, at birth. And that predicates that it didn't concentrate when it passed away in its previous lifetime. So this is the cycle we're talking about. And we explained that what is that's tra transmigrating. It's the body, energy, called prana, mind, thought, and ego. It's a five-fold package called the five sheaths, or upadis in Vedanta. And we, we looked at that and in, a, in a chart that you can look back on and see. After we looked at this chart about the problem of vishmriti, forgetfulness. So you might say, to sort of summate it, learn to concentrate. If you can learn to concentrate on anything, that's a beginning towards meditation. It's a beginning towards samadhi. And it's a beginning towards what they call in yoga, samyama, the ability to, to bring everything together into one point, to, to gather it all together and focus and get the essence out of any given thing that you put your mind on. Like, for instance, my teacher remembering the entire Gita in English and Sanskrit, and it, it never left his memory all those years, all those decades. So we saw it as living proof that he had concentrated so fully upon this that it had just ingrained itself in his divine memory. And from lifetime to lifetime, this is what makes a Rishi, or this is what makes a Jivan Mukta, a living liberated being, or this is what makes a seer, in part what makes a saint, to, or, or, or is this constant attention of the mind put in one pointed fashion on things of a spiritual nature. That, that then allows the soul to withdraw the essence out of anything. If it does, then, by dint of all these practices we've said, the soul remembers its past existence. Thenceforth, all lives are accompanied by worship of deities and meditation on formless reality. That's the second point there under divine memory. So the recall, the instant recall is there, the, the divine recall. Then everything in relativity, including objects, reflect light and remind the soul of Brahman and Brahman alone, which is what I was just chanting. I take refuge in that supreme Brahman whose light turns the attention towards, of mankind towards the Atman. So that would be the reference point of concentration leading to samadhi. Then finally, uh, near and dear souls are recognized as eternal companions from lifetime to lifetime. Like for instance, Brahmanandam, Shivam, Shantam, Premarupam, Naranjanam, Yogisham, Adbhutam, Nityam, Akhandadvaita, Lakshinam, Vigyanam, Trigunatitam, Turyabeda, Samgitam, Subodham, Shardam, Chaiva, Vivika, Shashi, Bhushanam. So I put my mind on those 16 great beings who are the divine companions of Sri Ramakrishna, their names there. Those are their spiritual names. And so they collected around Sri Ramakrishna, they're called Ishvara Kotis, around the avatar, and lived with him in that lifetime, which left such an impression on the world that here we are together, some 150 to 200 years later, um, benefiting from the teachings uh, that came forth from their concentration on God with form, Sri Ramakrishna himself, and a, a meditation on the formless reality, Brahman, or divine, the divine uh, transcendent consciousness, pure conscious awareness. So that's as much of a review of last week that I want to do, that I want to do right now. So just suffice to say that we, we took up what? What is it that's transmigrating? Let's look at where. <laughs> where is it transmigrating to? Because this might solve a few problems in people's thinking, uh, because we're right now sort of imbued with the scientific way of thinking. Like science is, you might say, the religion of the rest right now, particularly in America and Europe. So we, we need to, that's a conditioning we're talking about. My teacher used to talk about science as an upadi. It's actually, a, it's, it's a perspective that's been 
uh, foisted over our mind through people who are, have been looking for scientific discoveries in space, outer space, that is, and also here on the earth, and trying to make their lives more pleasurable and more successful and with less pain and more pleasure um, by doing so. And so then sort of hunkered down around the object being the thing that's going to satisfy you, whatever object it might be, uh, some TV or some uh, nuclear missile for some other pers person. That's going to be the object that delights them. And uh, focusing on finite matter is basically what it is. So then this inner realm that we're talking about now, where is it? That this soul, we've talked about what is it? It's the body mind mechanism with consciousness in a conditioned state or a limited state, focused on these levels of consciousness, which are insentient, forms a composite, and then uh, produces more of the same of itself. Like Raktabija, a drop of blood that fell from Raktabija's body turned into another Raktabija. So pretty soon the, the Divine Mother Durga was, was, was trying to uh, fight thousands of these Raktabijas because whenever she penetrated him with sword or spear or discus or mace, um, every drop of blood turned into another Raktabija. So this is kind of a, a symbology or an analogy for how the stunted body-mind complex that doesn't know its Atman, doesn't know its core or its center, keeps producing body-mind mechanisms throughout phases of time. So this is why sometimes it stuns us to think, the scriptures say, well, a thousand lifetimes is nothing, or a hundred lifetimes is nothing, because this can keep going on. But we know that it can't keep going on in the physical world for very long because of what science and archaeology have told us about how long we've walked upright for two legs. This assumes that we have, we, have, we have considered ourselves to be bodies, when we're not. We're consciousness that can produce bodies any time. All should be able to withdraw bodies without fear, because it's based on this eternal truth of bodilessness, formlessness, transcendent of names, even transcendent of space in which all of this is happening, and also time, cycles of time, can go on for hundreds and thousands of years producing these body-mind mechanisms. But what we don't realize at a late date like this means Kali Yuga is that they produce them, the mind produces them inside of itself in the collective mind and the cosmic mind. And then it also will produce worlds to which these subtle bodies can go to. <laughs> these are called dreams. So basically, when we look at a chart like I'm going to show you here, it came, it came to me to talk about where is, our, is this body-mind mechanism um, transmigrating to. Then you have to look at it sort of like waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, is that your consciousness changes, shifts levels of consciousness and goes from waking to dreaming. And when you've done that, you've dropped the body and senses, the outer objects, they don't, as if don't exist anymore. There's a silver thread that's connecting you to them still, a subtle thread, sort of spine-like, sort of, um, sort of uh, a sheath, they talk about it as a stalk of a lotus, still connecting you to the body. And so you go into dream, and this is taking place, of course, in the mind. And these dreams there in are where my father has many mansions and so forth. Um, my father's uh, mansion has many rooms or houses, sometimes it's interpreted as. That's the quote at the top of this chart. So where is the body-mind mechanism going? Because it's not just the body, physical body, it also has a subtle body that's coming and going. And it's, uh, it's not just the brain that's thinking itself into different states of awareness here on Earth. It's the mind that's doing that. So when you say body-mind mechanism in Vedanta, you have to realize there is more than one body, as we've seen with the five sheaths. And there's more than one world, as we've seen, as we will see with these teachings I'm about to show you. So 
here is one on this chart, one, two, three worlds. At the top, you see what I just pretty much quoted already. When Jesus said, neither shall they say, lo, here, or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. In my Father's house are many mansions, or abiding places, homes of rest and peace and sojourn. So these are what the Lord Jesus saw when he went into the wilderness, meditated upon his inner nature, and saw these kings of heaven. Uh, many of them, just like there are many worlds here in the physical space, outer space that is, there are also many worlds inside of the subtle world. This is called the second world. So with this quote, let's start at the bottom and show the first world. Boer loka is what we could call that. Remember, don't forget to remember that we're talking about this in terms of where does the body-mind mechanism transmigrate to. It's all happening in the great mind. So all of these are connected in with thought, with intelligence, to these lokas that have been seen by meditators for time out of, out of mind. This is millennia old, ages old in India's way of thinking. So you see at the bottom there sort of a palatial mansion there on the earth. And humans, animals, insects, and plants are the beings there. That's the first world. Um, about that, you can say, that it butts up against this second world called, in India, Bhuvar Loka or Pitri Loka. Pitris are your ancestors. So these are human beings and animals on the first world. But go inside one step to your subtle body and your subtle senses and into your dream state at night, depending on how dream, how deep your dream is and how conscious your mind is, you'll find the Bhuvar Loka, or sometimes called Petri Loka, semi-divine beings are there. Then to finish this train on this chart, before we look at some of the rest of it, a third world is there, they call it. And basically that's Svarloka, or sometimes called Devaloka. That's where the gods, the god of the gods called Indra, the Gandharvas, the Apsaras, and beings of uh, various quality of higher and lower quality of consciousness keep their subtle bodies or causal bodies in this third world. If, if you're talking about chakras, which we can show you in a minute on a chart, Basically, this is Svadhisthana and, uh, 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 and uh, this particular word, it, word, world is Manipura. So um, Muladhara would be the earth realm, and then Svadhisthana would be the nether realm, and then third realm would be Manipura. Those are three chakras. And don't forget the other four that go deeper and deeper inward. And all of these being in the great mind. So when you drop the physical, that's not the end of things. You pick up your subtle body, your dream body, and you've cut that silver cord that ties you to the earth and to the physical body. And now you're a, a, you know, like a balloon cut free or snapped free from its, its thread. One song in India sings. And it, it goes ahead and it moves inward towards these subtle, subtler realms. And these subtler realms become... Uh, more obvious and more available to the soul because they're not tied to the earth anymore. When the silver cord is, is intact and they're, they're tied to objects and worlds, physical world, they don't think very clearly unless they do this practice and this sadhana that we're talking about. And so they become rather limited in their thinking. For instance, Lord Buddha says, Beings of this world are blind. He's talking about pretty much the world we're in right now. Few are those who can see things the way they are. As birds escape from nets, rare are those who go to heaven. The miserly do not go to the world of the gods, and the foolish do not seek liberation. Only the wise become happy in the next world. Those who control the mind 
which wanders the worlds, but which resides in the cavern of the heart, will free themselves from all kinds of bondages. So this was said in the Pali language by Lord Buddha 550 years prior to Jesus's visiting of the earth. So you can see all these innuendos, some of which I was just saying are uh, included in there, how this very forgetful in this world, but there's a world of the gods in which beings fail to aspire for. So they're not, they're not aware that the kingdom of heaven is within or all knowledge lies within you, as I just quoted the father of yoga. So they don't cultivate the channels that go inward, say in meditation or by concentration. By focusing on something, you open up new rounds of thought in the mind. These are actually subtle channels that you can't see, but you'll feel them later as your sadhana progresses. You'll, you'll have clear meditations. You'll have experiences of seeing the light, hearing divine sounds. All of these things are the result of opening up nadis or channels that have been blocked previously due to the tyranny of your ancestors, to quote Swami Vivekananda. So basically, the Petri Loka is acting, the world of the ancestors is acting very strongly and very in a very limiting way upon the physical earth. And so people are um, imitating one another all the time. Uh, there are songs written about it that are very beautiful. Uh, and it's not just in Buddhistic tradition uh, that this is said either. Here's, here's what uh, is said in, in uh, Sri Ramakrishna's gospel. The mind is the gateway to heaven. It can also be the doorway to hell. So we're talking about patalas that fall below the earth realm even. So these are bad dreams, you might say. If, if earth is, is a mixed dream, and then the next, the next loka inside of you with your subtle body is a mixed dream, uh, a, a better dream, and then there's a best dream. You also have these nightmares that are still a part of the package in these minds that have not opened these channels or these, these levels. So answering the question, what is it that transmigrates? Where does it meant transmigrate to? And why is it transmigrating is what we hope to cover today. Um, let's see what else here we have. John says, John 3, 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Then marvel not when I say unto thee, thou must be born again. So that born again is not just, oh, I've become a changed person and now I'm a Christian. That born again really is a literal thing is that you're going to leave this earth and you're going to go to an inner world based upon your karmas, your predilections, your temperament, your character, and limited by your abilities or lack thereof. So the soul can build up power here on earth. That's what yoga is for, is build up these powers in order to allow it to move inward and attend upon consciously upon these worlds, which seemed like dreams to others but all of a sudden open up and become the very gateways to heaven. These experiences can be had in meditation too. It's not the highest meditation as Buddha just inferred, is that some go to heaven, but he also has plenty of teachings about how to get beyond transmigration to heaven. And uh, he, his, his teachings were, were based upon that. Sri Krishna talks about it in this way, the paths of the dark and the paths of light, of smoke and of the sun. I created these two paths in the beginning. By them, incarnate beings move, coming forth to enjoy or becoming fulfilled, going inwards to never return to the realms of external embodiment again. So again, leaves Sri Krishna to really clarify things about these two main paths, which are two main rivers that are moving. Uh, Lord Kapila called those like uh, Koivalya Pragbara, the path to freedom, and Samsara Pragbara, the path to continual rebirth and bondage. 
So smoke, the path of smoke, smoky path, or a dark path, and then the path of the sun, the path of light. Souls qualify themselves for those, and then move inwards towards those, as Buddha said. So you put Krishna, Buddha, Christ, and Christ's disciple side by side in this chart, and you can get a more complete picture of where it is that all these beings uh, have seen that that billions of souls are are moving inward. Some of them unable to go any further than than the third world, see, to the realm of the gods. Others can't even make it past heaven. We'll show you that in a minute. Something that clear that makes that even clearer. There you see the circle in the middle of a chart. Pretty much that is the uh, mind. When you say body mind mechanism. The mind is fourfold there. The antakarna, it's the inner cause of everything. That is dual mind because it's continually thinking pro con, this, that, life, death, life, death being pertinent here. Um, memory, loss of memory. All these dualities are constantly plaguing the mind. That's the manas part. It's a mixture of positive and negative. Chitta is the thoughts. The thoughts also will follow in that vein positive or negative. Ahamkara is this ego package that is riding this chariot of the mind mechanism. It's a sense of false I, it's who I think I am, who I think I was, and who I want to be. We can look at that in Zen in a minute. And then the booty itself, which has got the best light, it's got a chance to wake up the awakened Bodhi, Prabhuda Bharata is a name, Awakened India is a great name of a great magazine that has all these spiritual teachings in it. So, and that was what Lord Buddha liked to call himself too. He's talking about uh, awakened intelligence. I've read Sri Ramakrishna's quote there. We read Jesus at the top. This gives you a general outlay of the three worlds. Uh, as far as Hindu thought or Vedic thought is concerned. And it also includes a few elements out of Kundalini Yoga, especially on the, on the right-hand side of the chart there. Um, you see that there are the other seven lokas, chakras really, or lokas. Mahar Loka, sage, saints, sages, and rishis move there and then come back to earth from that, if, if, they, if they care to, come back to earth. So they, this is really where subtle bodies and causal bodies are kept in these deeper realms. I have a chart called the, the uh, Ancient Chest of Consciousness. It's, it's a dresser with three drawers, and Divine Mother's dancing on the top of it, and there's an ohm sign on it. So if you open up these three drawers, you get different things in them that have been pressed, ironed, put away, folded, put away in these chests of drawers. Everything's stored back in the chest of consciousness and then taken out and used by people. Hopefully it's, it's washed, iron folded and put back in, in, uh, in the uh, ready, ripe and ready form for the next incarnation in consciousness. So this is all going on in consciousness and the mind is really the hub of this conscious existence. As Sri Ramakrishna just said, it can be the gateway to heaven or the doorway to hell. And Holy Mother said, how do you treat your mind is very important as you get to Brahman, as you realize the, the non-dual Brahman. There you see Jhana Loka, mind born souls are there. Tapar Loka, <clears throat> the ascetics and the renunciates. And then finally, Satya Loka, also called Brahma Loka. That's where this trinity and the seven Sapta Rishis keep their subtle bodies. This is at least one rendering of, one or two renderings of three worlds plus four others that you find in, listed in Puranas, in Kundalini Yoga, and you'll find it in Tibetan Buddhists in another form. Uh, and in Zen Buddhist, I'll show you that uh, next. Let's just go to that now so we can make the impression on us of 
the question we're trying to answer there, here, since we answered last week, what is it that's transmigrating? How about where is it transmigrating? So there's one look, more Vedic look, at the three, three worlds in which transmigration is going on. One student sent me a, a question and, and a point and, and asked about, well, what if one just doesn't want to incarnate anymore? And I said, I wrote back and I said, well, uh, take a look at your desires for the answer to that one. Because, and then take a look next at unmanifested nature. Because if the, your desires are not fulfilled and unmanifested nature is still producing wonders in front of, dancing in front of your eyes, then there's no way the soul's going to be able to resist incarnation. That's why billions are coming. How about the Gita? Uh, uh, they come by, by the hundreds and thousands out of Prakriti, under the regime of Prakriti, he says, unable to resist embodiment. So that's in the Gita, he's talking about all these hosts of souls who go back into their subtle bodies with desire for unmanifested Prakriti and the ability to manifest it into worlds who do that very same thing. Therefore, they're born in the womb here on earth. So anyway, this was a question that was asked of me. And, I, and then I wrote back and I said, uh, if you're done with it, things here, then so be it. You, you, it's like Buddha, I'm gone and gone forever. But then I wrote back the next day with another thought. And I said, you know, uh, when our founder, Lex Sixon, was alive, he said, Babaji, you know, there's many better things to be born as than a human being. So I thought about that, sent it back as an answer to the student and included in it the fact that these realms of these three worlds are subject to transmigration, but these four are not necessarily. So you don't have to come back in a human form suffering the effects of your karmas or experiencing samsara or being under the press of mayic thought and mayic repercussions. Uh, you can you can graduate to these higher realms. So this is another place where the transmigrating soul can go to on its way to end the transmigration process. That's why we don't want to jump to the chase when we talk higher Buddhism or Advaita Vedanta. Let it go stage by stage. So we know what we're going through, that we're definitely done with it in this lifetime. And we graduate to the next avasta and the next higher way of thinking. And uh, the point being, at least the penultimate goal being, let's destroy our ignorance so that we don't have to return here forgetful of our true nature again. Basically what this whole class is about. If you want it in Zen, guess what? There it is. It's called in Japanese, Sangai Yui Ishin. It's uh, three worlds, one mind. So in Zen, you get the advantage of it being put into English in that way. Yes, they concur. There are three worlds here, and, uh, but it's all happening in one mind. So they'll, they'll make that statement because they're a mind-only school in their own way. So <clears throat> Lord Buddha even said that here at the top. They who follow the path of truth live happily in this world and in the hereafter. So this is prior to dissolving the body-mind mechanism, dissolving the mind in meditation and becoming one as you always are and always will be with Pragyapar. In this tradition, you have to say that's the word Lord Buddha used for absolute reality. Pragyaparam is supreme intelligence. So don't say that he didn't believe in God when he had words like Tathagatagarbha and Pragyaparam and other profound words that, that referred to Buddhi, intelligence at its highest level, pure conscious awareness. So there you see the three worlds in Zen. Sangai, it's called. There's the first world. They sometimes call it Kamaloka the sphere of desire. So that pretty much is in concurrence with everything we've been saying, isn't it? That desire brings you back and nature provides everything that you want. Uh, 
when you bring it into manifestation. So it's not in manifestation when you're in deep sleep tonight. It comes into manifestation when you dream, and then it solidifies itself when you wake. Then you dissolve it again into dream with your subtle body, and you go into your causal body and dissolve it into formless nature. And then you come back out of formless nature and form it again. This is not only going on every 24 hours, it's going on every lifetime, birth, life, rebirth, birth, life, death, rebirth. It's also going on over the four yugas, each yuga, many cycles. It's just, it's just like a breath. Breathe in, there it all is. You've brought, you've brought it from somewhere. Then you enjoy it. It's like Brahma and Vishnu. And then you breathe out, it's Shiva time, you see. And then there's nothing at the Kumbhaka. And then you breathe it all in again. Your breath is signaling exactly the teaching that you look at in terms of three worlds or three types of breath and the formlessness that's hiding itself behind it all. That's you. Your nature is formless. So in Zen here, they talk about the 28 divine realms of Buddhism. So this first realm holds hell beings. They're called Narakas. Human beings are there. We know that. We're amongst them. Animals are there, and six classes of gods or demigods are there. And the Asuras are here among us, too. So they, they think about these semi-divine beings and these semi-demonic beings as coming back into the earth realm in bodies. And that's why there's so much good here, and there's so much negativity here, because there's such a cross-section of beings inhabiting this kama loka, a loka of desire. Nothing much uh, too heavy to contemplate there, it's pretty clear. The quote there at the bottom says, seeing the body is temporal and the world is a mirage, one transcends the realm of Mara. Then the second realm, sphere of desireless form, it's called Rupa Loka. So you see how, or Rupa Datu. So you see how form is there as one of the great definers of our desire for encountering and enjoying all the, all the rich bounty that's in nature, both in its unmanifested form and its manifested form. Beings here on Earth only, only know its manifested form, tip of the iceberg but they don't know that it all comes from seeds in where? In the mind. All these worlds come from seeds in the mind. These seeds are held by great minds inside of the great mind. And these will be going on for thousands and thousands of cycles. Uh, basically, until a f the soul wants to is, fr is free of desire and wants to get liberated from that. I'm, it's like being in a bath too long, you get wrinkled, you see. I'm clean, I want to get out. So uh, there has to be a higher purpose for all of this desire and going through these cycles. So there pretty much you see its definition. Desire, ill will, sloth, restlessness, doubt, desires, becoming, ignorance. These are all pointing to the... the uh, requirements of attending upon the Rupa Loka, the second world, which would be the realm of your thought or f of subtle form. So those first five are called the five nivar Nivaranas. Pradosha is one of them called ill will. So these are great impediments to transcending the heaven realm and getting on to the third realm. And then finally, as Buddha taught, dissolve all worlds in space and time and return uh, to the formless reality, which you'll see in the next world. Then there's the elimination of ashrava. Uh, it's very powerful teaching. These three mean your desires. Why? Because you want to become something. So if you want to become something, you're not aware of being, of your being. You're trying to change yourself. So this is where the teaching of mutability and immutability comes in as you want to be something better, or you don't want to be something worse. And this all is back in the first world with all your fears. 
See, and all these beings that have attended these worlds, they're thinking in this way. Instead of thinking, I'm complete. I am Atman all abiding. I am pure. I am perfect. I require nothing. I am, the Atman is always fulfilled. It doesn't need um, fulfillment. And uh, there's no, when I look at it closely, there's no real transformation going on. There's only one Buddha nature or one Brahman existing at the foundation of all. Buddha also used those terms. He said, who is Brahman was one of the questions he asked in the, in the uh, Dhammapada. So desires becoming an ignorance, you must eliminate those three. That's called ashrava. This is in the second world. Then the practice of the four absorptions, which I said earlier I would show you, you have to become so absorbed that your desires are burnt like seeds. They won't come back again. Then you get empty mind, and with empty mind you get joy. Then you get equanimity, and finally perpetual wakefulness. Yogic insomnia, if you will. And Lord Buddha says about this world, as the fish taken out of its watery home and thrown onto land thrashes about, so does the mind tremble while trying to free itself from the dominion of Mara. Mara would be like Maya or would be devilish, those things that are controlled by beings who are devilish, like Asuras and, and Narakas and so forth in Buddhism. So a quick look at the, seven, the second world, side by side with this chart, we can see a little bit deeper explanation in the Vedic way and later on in, in early Buddhism. There you can see then the next loka is called Arupa loka. The last one was Rupa loka with form. Then classically it's Arupa loka. There's no form here. It's the sphere of formlessness called Arupadhatu. The quote there is, those wise ones who are absorbed in meditation, mindful, fully awakened, even the gods hold them dear. So the gods are back here, you see. Uh, and um, so they're praising these great beings like the Buddhas that come forth, the avatars, the Jivan Muktas, the seers, the avatutas and the saints and sages, they're praising these beings as they pass through their world, like a bolt of lightning. And uh, then, because they know that they're going to a deeper, formless place and that they can exist there, the gods don't think they can exist there yet. They don't know themselves as being formless. But these beings can go to what we are affectionately referring to as a causal realm. Actually, I think in Zen Buddhism and in Vedanta, that this third realm here we talked about, Devaloka, is actually transcended when you get into a Rupaloka. But you can see here why. There's advanced beings of four highest heavens there. So if you, if you look here at the list of beings that you go beyond, definitely humans and ancestors, semi-divine beings are transcended. And then we, we looked at this, I don't know if we mentioned it, in, oh, we did. Indra, Devas, the Devis, that's the gods and the goddesses, the celestial musicians and the celestial maidens and so forth, all get transcended and you find more advanced beings of the four highest heavens. Now for that, you're going to have to look over there. That's why I put these other four chakras or lokas over here. Sages, saints, rishis, munis, uh, uh, um, mind-born sons, um, and uh, Saptarishis are these great beings that you find in the Arupa Loka. So you can aspire for and take birth there if you're not pulled down by the weights of uh, the Bur Loka, or what you're calling up here at the top, Rupa Loka. So name, form, time, space all begin to disappear. This is what we've sometimes called the dissolution of the mind stream. So that all these elements that are causing us, that, that are dragging us from birth to death and death to birth, as Swami Vivekananda has said in his Son of the Sannyasin, leave us alone 
and we began to become more and more settled, more and more solitary, more and more uh, seated in one, one great mental position in the great mind. And from there, then we realize that all of this is a projection of our own mind. All these worlds, all these bodies, and all these beings all exist inside of us. There, there are songs we could sing about that. But this, this goes to this higher heavens. In fact, it does remind me of this song that Swamiji used to like to sing to Sri Ramakrishna. beautiful song. Return to your own abode, your eternal home. You are a foreigner in this foreign land. Why do you roam about aimlessly with no real purpose? The five senses and the five elements, all these are different from you. None of them belong to you. Why have you become senseless in your attachment to others and forgotten your own true nature? That's the part that I vocalized and sang just now. So this foreign land means, of course, these lower worlds. Um, why have you become senseless or aimlessly wandering around here? Your true nature is beyond all the worlds. It's actually formless. And you're getting towards formlessness when you aspire towards higher consciousness or a more awakened intelligence, when the mind becomes enlightened. Because it's in the mind where all of this is happening, you see. He goes on, and I didn't sing this, this part. O mind, set yourself on the path of truth, and with every moment, light your way with the lamp of devotion. Secretly and with great effort, keep the riches of your good deeds with you for sustenance and provision. Then he says, Greed and delusion, the highway robbers on the road of life, rob all travelers of their belongings. With great care, keep the two sentries, inner peace and self-control, to watch over you. Finally, in the, in the last verse, he says, there is a roadside inn, that's in this journey inward. There is a roadside inn known by the name Holy Company. Take rest there if you are tired and weary. If you are confused about the way home, ask help of the holy ones who live there. If you get frightened along the way, call upon the king of the land with all your heart. The king has great power over that path. Even the Lord of death is afraid of him. So there you see death has been put in its own grave as uh, fear has been made afraid of itself, as we talked about last week. And so this is one of these beautiful songs which Sri Ramakrishna heard his young disciple, Swami Vivekananda Narendra, sing, and then went into this high samadhi when he heard about this, because he himself was very versatile with all these inner realms. And that's what we do when we meditate upon great souls like Buddha, Jesus, Ramakrishna, and Krishna and others, is that we're opening nadis for our concentration to flow towards these great beings who have attained freedom from birth, growth, disease, old age, decay, and death, and have gone beyond um, the three worlds. 
and have, have, have therefore arrived at the realization that their true nature is birthless and deathless, timeless, formless, and absolute. So this is what this is leading towards. If you finish out this chart real quickly, after taking these musical interludes to help explain it, you can see that these wise ones who are absorbed in meditation, even the gods hold dear. So there are advanced beings in the four highest heavens, and they practice the four stages of formlessness. Uh, just like we here should practice uh, Daiva Shmriti, we should try and bring our memory back to these teachings. Perhaps we've heard it a lot in past lifetimes but haven't realized it. Perhaps we've never heard it at all. What is it in the, in the Upanishads? Shravanayapi buhu bir hyola labyaha shrinvato pi bahavo yamna vidyuhu ascharyo gata kusalo shalabdaha ascharyo vakta kusalo nushishtaha. Beautiful Upanishadic slokas committed to memory that, remem that make you remember that some have never heard the truth but some have heard it and have failed to realize it. But wonderful is the one who speaks of it, and fortunate is the one who hears of it. But extremely blessed is the one who realizes it here in this very life. So this is why divine memory is so important to have on our side. Uh, we can't walk around, as Buddha said here in this chart, uh, uh, completely oblivious to where we are, who we are, what we're doing, and where we're going, and eventually that we don't have to go at all. It's all happening in the great mind. So this is why Swami Vivekananda said, coming and going is all mere nonsense. Where will be the time of coming when all of time is in the soul? And where will be the time of going, uh, the space to go to when all of space is in the soul? So yes, when we're talking about time and space and lokas and karma and transmigration and all that, it's all relative. These are the teachings that Dharma help us understand if we've had our minds clouded by pursuit of money, power, objects, and all these things which we've already read the riot act on in part. So these Four stages of formlessness, you could say this is Zen Buddhist, Zen Buddhist teaching, Zen Buddhism's teaching of what you would concentrate on to become a realized soul. First, you concentrate on the akasha, limit, limitless space. Then viganam, you get that highest consciousness that, that's uh, in Buddhism is beginning to qualify you to go beyond knowledge. Then arupa, you encounter nothingness. It's very classic also in, in Vedanta, and the same as Buddhism, is that there's this emptiness or this nothingness that happens. The soul is stunned at first, but then it says, wait a minute, I'm still here. You see, everything else went away, but who am I? You know, there's, there's the real me, it has come forward. If you were to ask the question, who am I then, you would probably get the definitive answer. But people are trying to answer it back on earth without doing the practice. And this is our objective, our objection to uh, jumping stages too quickly before we're ready to understand it. So even in just the third world alone, you practice formlessness. It's a very beautiful thing. Um, not that you can't, if you're one of these more advanced souls, practice formlessness in your own tradition on earth, in the human body. That's what Jivan Mukta, what leads to Jivan Mukta, or you can become a Jivan Mukta. It leads to Jivan Mukti, a living, liberated state. Lord Buddha, one of my favorite quotes of his out of the Dhammapada is this, difficult is a human birth, Difficult is mortal life. Difficult is really hearing the truth. Rare is the appearance of the enlightened ones. So very unlikely that you would meet many enlightened beings in, this, in these three worlds. Why? Because you can walk right past them and not recognize them. Why? Because you haven't 
the common jewelry at yourself so you can assess the values of a diamond. This is how Sri Ramakrishna would say it. So if you're um, dull and ignorant and unawakened, everyone and everything is going to look that way to you because that's the way your mind has been colored. Put on uh, blue glasses, everything turns blue. Put on yellow glasses, everything turns yellow. Sri Ramakrishna said. So put on these bifocals of Brahman, then everything will begin to look like what it really is, which is how he started out saying here, is that most pe people here are blind. Few are those that see things the way they really are. So even here on earth, you can see things as they really are. If you purify the senses and go beyond them and begin to see their essence as formless, it's the essence we're looking for here. Um, to put a capper on where, the question where we are transmigrating to, mm, let's take a, if, if we can get this up, let's take a quick look at a review of what and where. I hope you're following me here. People ask, what is it that's transmigrating? Because they think, they hear Buddha nature or Atman, how, Pragyaparam, however you want to call that ultimate reality, does not get born, does not die. And there, but <laughs> there they are being born and dying in relativity. There they are getting attached to objects when the great seers don't. The great souls do not get attached to objects. So there's some problem here, isn't there? There's some contradiction here between just declaring that I am that and then going back to your old life and not living, I am that. And this was expressed nicely back in this chart we just looked at when they called it uh, Ashravas. You see that the problem of desire and becoming is there. I must become something else based on a desire I have to fulfill myself with things that aren't real. How can you fulfill yourself with things that aren't, can't fulfill you? And are just a mass of swirling particles, and you're trying to satisfy yourself on them. It's like eating cotton candy for nutrition. It's not going to work. So let's take a quick look at this long chart. It's not going to take very long to go through it, but it will kind of fuse the two questions we're looking at last week and this week in terms of getting our memory back in terms of what is it that transmigration and where is it transmigrating to. So you can see across this is pretty much a threefold, uh, a threefold teaching, all the way up to the three types of the ego. Let's look at it because it could clear up some residue of questions that may still be, still be lingering. So there you see what we just looked at in terms of the body on the left-hand side. We have a gross body, we have a subtle body, and we have a causal body. And that's what's transmigrating from heaven to earth to hell in the three worlds. Couldn't put it any more clearly. Jump over and look at the middle category, sheaths or kosha. That's what we looked at last week, right? The, the gross body is made of the anamaya kosha is, is, is associated or directly correlative with the sheath of food. Look down to the subtle body on the left category look back to the middle category, the subtle body consists of the pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, and vijnanamaya kosha. Those things are operating in the dream state very powerfully. And in these subtle realms, when the body has, when the soul has dropped its physical body and now lives full time in its subtle body in these realms, particularly in one of them. Then the causal body correlates with the Anamaya Kosha. So last week's chart was about these as for an answer of the question to what is it that's transmigrating? It's these sheaths attended by a consciousness that's not awakened. If you look at it over here, then you see uh, we're looking at it as terms of the three worlds. Now, the condition of the body which is the sheath of food is called stula. It's gross. Stula sharira. That's a designation for the gross body in Sanskrit. The 
condition of the subtle body is called sukshma sharira, and the condition of the causal body is called karana sharira. The words, the words speak for themselves. Kara means cause. So basically, your causal body causes your subtle body, which then causes your gross body from inside out. It's the way it goes. It's called evolution, but it's far beyond the evolution that science is teaching in the West. It's, it's a whole manifestation of 24 cosmic principles. Turn around, give them up. Take them on, turn around, give them up. Just like your breath, remember, or just like your waking, dreaming, deep sleep every 24 hours, or just like a 100-year lifetime when you're born, you're young, you get old, and you die, or just like a yuga of those kinds of lifetimes, hundreds and thousands of those times of lifetimes, without ever waking up to all of this is nonsense. It's all a dream. It's all a projection. It's going on in my mind. I should purify my mind and transcend the need to rebirth, to be re reborn, to suffer again, or just to enjoy. There's much higher things to do with the body-mind mechanism. You can purify it, and then it'll have access to all of these heavens within you. Now, the state across the board here, the gross body is called waking. Subtle body is called dreaming, that is, jagrat and swapna. And the causal body is called shishupti, deep sleep. So I'm showing you that part because this has been meditated on for aeons. For a better uh, word for us would be, in Sanskrit, would be um, yugas. Yugas. They've talked about waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. So they have words for it that immediately infer the philosophical connotations. Jagrat, Swapna, and Shishupti. So if you walk into a, a group of seekers of Brahman, or you're with the knowers of Brahman, and you say, tell me about Jagrat, Swapna, and Shishupti, they'll perk up right away and they'll tell you, oh, you've heard of that secret, huh? Good, it's about time. Now let's awaken completely. Let's be fully awake. Prabhuda Tratishtat, the Tantra said, we should awaken into mother. We should be fully awakened all the time. And uh, your body can sleep. It's fine. But your mind stays focused. That's the third eye you're talking about there that never closes. It might close at Mahapralaya when everything shuts down. There's even Krishna then sleeps. Brahma sleeps. Vishnu sleeps at the end of a cosmic cycle. But then they breathe in again, just like you do in the morning, and everything is there. See? Hopefully sunny and, and joyful and healthy uh, with seeing with these eyes what is good and spiritual, hearing with these ears what is noble and uplifting. Bhadram karne bihi srinayama devaha. May everything show itself as the divine being to us and not hide itself behind coverings all the time. In Advaita Vedanta, then, the identity of the body, gross body, is called Vaishvanara. It's a desire of objects, and there's no problem with that. Uh, uh, that's explained in Gaudapada's Karika, how the enjoyer of objects, if he knows the difference between the object and the enjoyer, then he can go ahead and enjoy, and he doesn't get drug into identification with unreal things. As put by the father of yoga late, later, they can move amongst the objects of senses without becoming impeded by them. So if we look at these teachings by two of the greatest souls in India, um, Patanjali and, and uh, later on his, his guru's guru, Gaudapada, when he was incarnated as Govindapada, then we see it's very clear that you need to take some element out of that picture that is causing others uh, suffering, which those very same things do not cause the illumined suffering. They suffer for you only. They don't suffer because they're attached to, uh, to things. They're the, they're the uh, enjoyer of all objects. The divine enjoyer. So there you see on the other 
the next level, Taijasa means enjoyer of the dream worlds, and then Pragya means enjoyer of bliss, that causal state of formlessness. So you can see how these are running down from the ancient rishis through to the teachings of Vedanta, the teachings of Advaita, and the, and the teachings of Buddhism are all telling us about these three worlds and how the beings incarnate in them, consciously or unconsciously. And so then that brings us to the final look at where is it that the soul is incarnating. As long as we know mainly that it's all going within, because the kingdoms of God are within, Jesus said, something that we should have looked at literally a long time ago. There are many things in the Bible we shouldn't be taking literally. They're just metaphorical, and they've become rather superstitious. But if we looked at some of these great teachings literally, then all of a sudden we would waken up to the fact that uh, when you, you don't have to um, um, wait till you go to sleep tonight to dream. You're in dream number one right now, and you're going into dream number two tonight. And you can do it all consciously. So this other sideways chart here, is uh, about the seven spheres. When I read the Tantras and the Puranas and read the uh, um, even references to some of these things in some of the 108 Upanishads, and they give different reckonings and different lists of the beings, the worlds, and the attainment of souls, then um, I listed down a lot of these systems. Um, and sometimes, as I say, we're expressing them through systems such as Kundalini Yoga with the chakras. Other times we're expressing them through uh, 24 Cosmic Principles of Lord Sampkya, uh, Lord Kapila in the Sampkya tradition. And then we're also expressing them in other ways. So here's one way of looking at it, uh, seven ways of looking at it in one chart. See there the sheaths and the koshas, we already looked at them. So you're reviewing last week when you look down the left-hand column. They correlate with the spheres, or brahmandas, they're called. You'll find that, that uh, word in the Upanishads, these, wor these worlds. They're also called sometimes spandas, like in Shaivism. They're vibrating worlds inside of the mind, where souls drop their physical body in their growth sheath, as we've just looked at, take on a subtle body, and move their way inward to these worlds with uh, only those impediments that are going to keep them. One of them, uh, keep them from doing so. One of them being this impaired memory, that uh, the memory hasn't been reawakened and been, been made retentive of all this Dharma teaching that's available to you every day here, even on this planet. So there you see, um, should uh, take this from the bottom up, this category, Burloka, we looked at that here on this other chart. Bhuvarloka, Svarloka, Mahalarka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and Brahma Loka. This is just um, reviewing the five sheaths and these seven worlds that we've already looked at. There's another system which calls these worlds dvipas. So from the bottom up you can see Jambu Dvipa correlates to the physical world. Shaka Dvipa is the etheric or astral world. Kusha Dvipa is the celestial world. Kransha Dvipa is the lower causal world. Shamali Dvipa is the intermediate causal world. Plaksha Dvipa is the higher causal world. And Pushkar Dvipa is the subtlemost of all worlds. This is a system that's very ancient and not very well available to most of us to study today, but here's yet another system that puts it in terms of these seven, seven worlds. Sri Ramakrishna used to talk about it as a, as a castle with seven floors, that you'd, you'd go up to the highest floor in order to find Brahman, to find the ultimate. 
there it is in terms of chakras then. I just we mentioned those earlier. It's the muladhara is the root of the spine. Svadhisthana is the generative organs, the level of the generative organs. Manipura is the level of the navel or stomach. Anahata then is the level of the heart. Vishuddha level of, uh, of uh, intelligence. Agya chakra, the level of divine vision. And Sahasrara, named the thousand petal lotus, is of course beyond all worlds and all beings. Now probably the most interesting and infor informative part of this chart is what I've written here up the right hand side uh, as you're looking on. See that basically there is this tendency of, of the soul to, to perfect itself or to realize its inherent perfective, perfection as it moves through this transmigration process. Of course when it transmigrates beyond the three worlds then the going gets good and the higher heavens as was just said by some of our quotes here are very favorable and very beautiful they're actually in terms of Zen Buddhism where you can actually practice formlessness and do away with form more easily where it's difficult to do that here on earth for the right hand column let's uh, look at, at it from the top down it would be more valuable Illumined souls transcend the Brahma Loka and merge with Brahman itself. So beyond those, the highest of all those seven, this soul gets its final emancipation, as Patanjali says. The Chitti Shakti in them, that is intelligence in them, as Divine Mother, strips away name and form from nature and returns them to their ultimate source. It's the last sutra in of the fourth pada of Patanjali's uh, Yoga Sutras. Those souls, nearly free of all desire for the realms of embodiment, go quickly to the higher worlds. There they will merge with Brahman in due time. Across the board, all, of course, with these realms of Taparloka and the realms of, uh, of uh, the Agya Chakra and so forth, uh, probably better to look over here and see uh, that these, uh, as we looked at already, it's also here, is that there are some souls that will, that will uh, uh, keep themselves just short of merging with Brahman. They'll keep some sort of a subtle sense of I-ness, separate I-ness with them. Uh, uh, <laughs> can we quickly go back? because I, that was an important part of the chart. There's three types of ego at the bottom here. Um, let's look at that. You can see there, it's Lord Vashishtha's teaching. Uh, there's the Deha Jasa Hamkara ego. Deha Jasa means attached to the body. So basically, the quote here, attached, fear-based ego self, which causes suffering through false identification of the Atman with the body. So that is Vashishta's um, description of those beings who are very attached to the physical form and the physical world. So they're not going to be cognizant of moving into even the lower three, uh, beyond the lower well world into the next two worlds within, the lokas, the next two lokas, or the next two chakras. Then, if you see next to that on the left, there's an ego that's called sakshahamkara. We know saksha means witness. So there's the ego that becomes more ripened. It's beneficent and detached witness self, which is ever-existence and transcendent of the worlds of name and form. So this ego ripens itself so much so that it begins to see that it's not the lower self, it's not attached to the ahamkara, the lower self, but it's actually the great self. Buddha speaks about this in the Dhammapada again. So there are two selves here. There's the lower self and the higher self. And uh, 
So he talks about the supreme self and the individual self and their distinction. But then Vashishta talks about a paramahamkara, supreme self which reveals the cohesive unity between Atman, living beings, and the worlds. That's a beautiful quote from Lord Vashishta that pretty, pretty much puts together everything we've been talking about in the last two classes. This supreme self reveals the unity between our true nature, Atman, between all these beings that accompany all these worlds and the worlds themselves. That's a cohesive substratum uh, called, Meister Heckert called it, cohesive substratum. So he says, there are three types of bodies associated with three types of hahamkara. And so that was what we didn't get to, what I meant to get to on this chart. And of course, that first ego is transmigrating all the time through the three worlds. Let's, in the remaining minutes, then uh, finish up the right-hand side of this seven spheres, seven worlds, seven chakras, and five koshas that we just looked at. So we talked about, and you can see it in terms of the arrows on one side of the chart here. We're coming down from the top. There are beings possessed of love, nonviolence, equanimity, and virtue. They rise easily to the higher causal realms, transcending rebirth in the physical, astral, and celestial worlds. So the three worlds can get transcended more easily by these beings who, as Jesus said, love the Lord with their whole heart, their whole mind, and their whole soul. That causes an opening in what's usually called the um, Brahma Granti and the Vishnu Granti, these knots in consciousness which keep billions and billions of souls from realizing their true nature. They're self-restricting themselves. So uh, otherwise, on the, on the other side, in, in the third world, beings trying to transcend them, it says here, pious people with unfulfilled desires arrive at the Svarloka and get reborn on earth to fulfill them. So they keep coming back to try and fulfill their desires, but they're only going as far as the lower causal world, if you look across the chart. Or uh, they're not quite making it to the past the Manipura chakra. They're not quite going further enough inside to transcend the gods in Svarloka. And they're, they're still attached to uh, uh, prana, Maya Kosha. There's the prana, how the ancestors are attached to the prana, because that's how children get born. That's how food gets enjoyed and eaten. That's how the lungs breathe. So the whole thing has to do with prana. See that on the far left-hand side? Prana pervades all seven spheres. <laughs> I just put it as a, as a golden rule there on the left-hand side. And so from Earth all the way up to Purusha and Mahat, uh, the Purusha and the Mahat, all the prana comes out of this. Some uh, at a very high level, we'd probably be want to include Shakti into this, Chitti Shakti, the mother of our thoughts the mother of wisdom. But this prana flows out of these great cosmic principles, like the Trinity, for instance, and infills all the worlds at different levels of uh, subtle energy. Prana is something that we don't understand very well. Also, tanmatras is something we don't understand very well. If we look at the 24 cosmic principles in the West today, those of us who are looking at the Indian Dharma teachings, we could probably understand most everything is said there except for those two words. I mean, we'd know what hearing, seeing, uh, uh, and tasting, and touching, and so forth. We know what that means. And we know what mind, and hamkara, and intelligence, and ego, and thoughts mean. All of this isn't very difficult to sort through. But when it comes to tanmatras and prana, we strip up because we haven't gotten those teachings in the West. It's been pronounced in the Indian Dharma uh, that there are subtle senses and subtle elements inside of you. If you don't know about them, how can you transcend the earth and, and nature? 
outer nature. You can't. You get attracted to it. But once you know that it comes from a source called unmanifested prakriti, which is one of the things Krishna is on and on about in the Gita to Arjuna, so that he won't have to come back and fight another battle like that again, then all of a sudden these nadis are open, understanding happens, you have a divine memory come back, and it begins to settle in, and it'll remake your whole thinking process, as we've seen it do the Buddhism, the Vedanta, the Yoga, the Samkhya. We've seen this do this with people, even in this day and age, these souls who are, as I mentioned, living liberated souls who we don't recognize, but they have this inner realization going on that makes their memory retentive and their mind pure. So, otherwise, transmigration is taking place here. Attached to the earth plane, and these beings then go from heaven to earth to hell. It drags from heaven to earth to hell the soul, Vivekananda says. So say, say peace to all. No danger be to me that ought that lives. Just open up to this, uh, to viewing and witnessing this, and um, practice this art of divine memory, Daiva Shmriti. There are also these, at the very bottom there, we mentioned the Patalas, the seven hell realms, Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Rasatala, and Patala are very bad dreams to be having in the mind, in the, in the dark night of the soul. So these, uh, of course, um, can be transcended and are transcended by people all the time. Uh, is we can see even in the Zen Buddhist chart that there's some, some angry beings, some wrathful deities actually positioning themselves in the second world. And there's some of them here still pretty angry if you look at politics and military. But uh, some of these beings do rise out of that nightmare and try to better themselves. So they need this Dharma to help them. And this is why we have focused mostly on today's class on where is it that transmigration is happening? That is, what directions does it go? And I've done my level best here in three or four different systems to answer that question. So hopefully we've answered what is it that transmigrates? Where is it that it's transmigrating? Next week I hope to say, why is it transmigrating? Other than just desires um, and the reasons that we've given here, is that basically the mind is full of impressions and we're going to look at those. They're called samskaras. So that's going to answer this question of what is the impetus that causes beings to go from birth to death and death to birth and drag themselves as a limited complex through these experiences when the beautiful, divine, non-dual essence called Atman is looking on, perfectly detached from all of that. And that thou art, as Vivekananda tells us. So Om Tachnayo Ravrini Mehe Gatum Yogyaya Gatum Yenupate Daivi Swastarastu Naha Swastir Manuse Vyaha Urdham Jagatu Besajam Sangno Astu Dvipade Sang Chachushpate Om Shanti 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 He Come and let's make a humble and sincere offering of the small self into the great self. May we always delight in this offering and revere the Lord and Mother of all offerings and sacrifices. May divine blessings then be upon us. May peace come into the entire human race. May healing, well-being, and prosperity then always abide among us. <coughs> Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us. May peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tatsat.